very resilient state. That's what Governor Rick Scott says about Florida. The reason why is our first story today on CNN 10. After Hurricane Michael struck last Wednesday, Governor Scott toured the hardest hit areas. He described Mexico Beach, which apparently took the brunt of the storm, as being like a war zone. U.S. President Donald Trump and First Lady Melania Trump joined the governor Monday after taking an aerial tour aboard Marine One. The president was also expected to visit parts of Georgia that were hit. Just making sure everyone's safe, that they're fed. You know, many of these people have no, they have no home. Some of them have no trace of a home. You wouldn't even know it just got blown right off the, the footing. The Category 4 hurricane left behind clear examples of what a storm that strong can do. Dozens of beachfront homes are simply gone. Some were lifted by waves and wind and carried to other places. In Mexico Beach, one resident says the Florida Panhandle's still his home, that he's going to rebuild somehow. Part of that resilience the governor spoke of. The city's police chief says search crews are looking for 30 to 35 people who are still missing. Officials have made progress in getting to the most heavily damaged parts of Florida. We've been around this Mexico Beach area now for three days, and you are still stunned by the forces of nature that played here, both the tidal storm surge and then on top of that, the tremendously high winds that just wreaked havoc. But let me start you with the good news. And the good news, and there is a lot of good news. Let me start with the fact that there are thousands of first responders that have made it into the community here and they have been doing a tremendous amount of work. The first thing they had to do was just clear their way to get into this community. Clearing the roads has been almost a heroic effort. They've managed to get the major thoroughfares open and that's essential for the rest of the relief to come in. The other good news is that relatively the death toll is incredibly low compared to the, the massive amount of destruction that you see here. And then the other good news, uh, telephones, cell phones at least, have begun to work again. It's a little spotty, but I can't tell you how much that means, both for first responders to coordinate their relief efforts and also for the people who were trapped here who can now reach out to their loved ones and let them know that they survived alive and well. Now the bad news. There were about 300 people, give or take, that rode out the storm here, and they are still trying to account for all of them, and they have not been able to do that. There is a significant number that are still missing, hence why the search and rescue effort is still ongoing. 10 second trivia. Which of these U.S. retail companies started as a mail-order watch and jewelry business in 1893? J.C. Penney, Zales, Tiffany & Company, or Sears? Sears Roebuck & Company got its name in 1893, though Richard W. Sears had been in business years before that. Sears Holdings, the parent company of both Sears and Kmart, is filing for bankruptcy. It's been struggling for years, and it had a debt payment that was due on Monday that it just couldn't afford to pay. Hundreds of Sears and Kmart stores have already been closed this year. There are 700 that are still open, and their parent company says that 142 of them will be closed in the weeks ahead. Bankruptcy does not necessarily mean that Sears is going out of business, though many companies that file for bankruptcy do. Sears Holdings is planning to keep open its profitable stores along with its websites. But as the company's future looks uncertain, its past is an undeniable part of America's retail heritage. Back in the late 1800s in Minnesota, Richard Sears was spending his days as a railroad station agent. Until one day, he sold some watches from a local jeweler and realized he was really good at selling. So in 1886, he started a mail order company, the R.W. Sears Watch Company, and eventually hired a watchmaker, Alva C. Roebuck. And in 1893, Sears, Roebuck & Co. was born. Sears then became a very successful mail order catalog company. This business model broke the mold. Remember, most Americans were living in small towns with access to only a few stores. They often made their own clothes and furniture, or did without. Sears' early catalogs only featured watches and jewelry. But soon, these catalogs were more than 500 pages long. People could buy anything from shoes, wagons, stoves, and musical instruments. Sometimes, people even bought their homes directly from Sears. And because Sears bought in bulk, the company was able to charge customers lower prices. In 1925, Sears opened its first retail location in Chicago. And it wasn't just retail. Sears had a radio station, a mortgage business, a credit card. Sears was everywhere. Annual sales hit $1 billion in 1945. The next year, 
sales doubled. Once Americans started to move to the booming suburbs after World War II, Sears began investing to help build malls. By 1970, Sears was considered untouchable by its rivals. But not all stories have a happy ending. As the 20th century came to a close, so did Sears' reign. Some of the war veterans who fought with the U.S. military have never set foot on American soil, but they've helped American troops navigate and survive in countries like Iraq and Afghanistan, countries whose native languages are Arabic, Dari, and Pashto. Matt Zeller is a U.S. Army Reserve Captain and Afghanistan war veteran who's helping foreign veterans find a new and safer home in America. His nonprofit, No One Left Behind, has helped thousands. I literally would not be here today if it wasn't for Janish and Wari, my translator during a deployment with the U.S. Army in Afghanistan. Hey, cover fire, go! He actually saved my life when he shot and killed two Taliban fighters who were about to kill me in a battle. <laughs> Afghan and Iraqi translators, they put themselves and their families at extreme risks to help us with our military's mission. Janice was hunted. The Taliban assigned a hit team to go after him and his family. There were bounties placed on their heads. I made him a promise. I said, I'm gonna get you and your family to safety here in the United States. It took five years. When he arrived, we decided we were gonna start an organization to bring Afghan and Iraqi interpreters who served with the military to safety here in the United States. We help them get their visas, and then when they arrive in the United States, we actually greet them at the airport. Goodbye. In customs. There they are. So today we have an Afghan translator coming to America for the first time with his wife and his two very young daughters. We're a tribe. So on a deeper level, I want these Afghans and Iraqis to feel like they have been welcomed, that they're thanked and honored for their sacrifice. Hey! Welcome home. Welcome. Hey. Welcome home. Welcome. Thanks for everything. Thank you. Welcome to your new country. You've earned this. This is your home now. We're so happy that you're here. Welcome to the United States. I get shot by the Taliban because they knew that I worked with the coalition forces and one time they kidnapped me. It took four years that I could come with my family to nest it. They gave me the opportunity to live in here in a safe place. I will never forget that. Once they get here, we find them a place to live. We fully furnish their home. All right, we gotta talk about the next phase. We help them get a job. One of the things that we'll need to do is get you a resume. Since I'm here, this organization really helped me. We were trying to build our life in the United States. We were really happy. <laughs> These individuals fight shoulder to shoulder with our troops. They're proud patriots who signed up to defend their country and to help us with our mission. How could we leave these people behind? A short list of animals you don't want to escape from their cages. Snakes. But that happened recently at Hayfield High School in Alexandria, Virginia, when a boa constrictor named Buddy broke out. Boas aren't venomous, but his escape still set off alarms, both actual and emotional. An animal control officer located and wrangled the wayward reptile, and Buddy's cage got new security upgrades. Someone put rocks on top of it. So now we'll see if Buddy's serious about getting out, if his ambitions can be constricted, or if he's truly an a snake artist. Assuming he's the type to boast about it, he's probably quick to strike up a conversation, tell his tale, and wag his forked tongue here, slither, and everywhere. I'm Carl Azus for CNN 10.